What's up everyone? It's been a long time since I've made any sort of videos regarding airplanes at all. I've been super busy with work, but I wanted to do a bit of an update and all my friends are sick of hearing me talk about seaplanes. So I figured I might as well put it out here. I picked up that Sea Ray LSX last June and I made two videos about it at the time, but I haven't really done anything else. But really last year I focused on learning to fly the plane and getting the plane kind of like up to snuff maintenance wise. So I bought the Sea Ray LSX in Minnesota. I had a conditional inspection done and a pre-buy inspection done up there. And then we ferried the plane home. When I got the plane home, I had to replace the battery. I did an oil change. And then uh, I think a couple days later, I had a Sea Ray instructor come up and meet me at my field and do two days of transition training to both learn the plane and teach me how to fly it and also to satisfy my insurance requirements so that I could fly it solo. Relax, relax, there you go. Porpoise, pull back, pull back. There you go, that stopped it, perfect. Aileron to keep the wings yep, level. Yep. <laughs> right there, that's it, perfect. Awesome. I'd gotten my single engine C seaplane rating last year, 2021 in June, in a Super Cub, and flying the Sea Ray is dramatically different than flying a you know traditional aircraft on floats. There's a lot of like little quirks and stuff. Plus, it's a much lighter plane, um, and it has some unique handling capabilities. And then also the insurance requirement, which for me was five hours of dual instruction and 15 water landings to be made with um, a pilot that met the requirements, which I think was 250 hours in type. So I did that dual instruction time. I learned a ton. It was really an awesome experience. I love learning and progressing as a pilot. And so I was really excited to actually, you know, do the training. The Siri handles dramatically different on water, especially than a traditional float plane, but it also handles differently in the sky too. You know, coming from my Grumman Tiger, where I can take off and, and honestly like barely touch the rudder for an entire cross country flight, the Sea Ray, you're like kicking rudders the entire time. It's a tail wheel, it's lightweight, it has a ton of drag, it's not fast. Um, and there's a lot of ways that it can kind of um, bite you and you really have to be on the ball with your approach and landing speeds. As a matter of fact, right after I got done doing my transition training, I was so excited to go out and, and solo it to fly it alone without my instructor. Um, I went and took my wife up, we went to the Hardy Dam, and I literally immediately almost sunk it. Like our third water landing, I came in too fast, um, then skipped once, and then did exactly what you're not supposed to do, and I put in some pilot input and actually increased an oscillation of porpoise and uh, ended up slapping the tail wheel and kicking the plane. It wasn't an awesome experience. Kelly, my wife, wasn't super hyped. And I was like, oh my gosh, what a Muppet. Like I literally almost sunk it on the first flight. Like I'm a AOPA true pilot story right now. Like I can hear the announcer's voice in my head. Um, and so that prompted me to, you know, make sure that you're always on your speeds, which means approaches at 65 miles an hour and you're touching down the water at like 52-ish miles an hour. And I'm using a lot of glassy water technique to just kiss that water and not flare the airplane. You don't really flare a Sea Ray, which is uncommon because I'm used to in the Tiger just cranking that thing back and keeping the nose wheel off. But the Sea Ray, you kind of just fly it to the water, right to the step, like uh, a wheel landing in the tail wheel aircraft, which it is. Um, and once you kind of get that down, it makes a lot more sense. And then I've, I've been able to like butter those landings. And I'd say I can get at least a four out of 10 landing now, but I've had a number of uh, really smooth, water landings that you don't even know when you when you touch the water it just just caresses it and it's like the most magical experience you honestly sometimes have to look out the window and be like oh yeah i'm actually floating not flying anymore um a ton of fun so i won't say i'm good yet uh but you know i feel a lot more comfortable in it and i kind of know what the plane's doing and my confidence is is much higher i've learned to beach the plane how to you know drive out on the wheels it took me a couple tries to get that down I nosed it over once because you need to have full stick back, full power, which you know feels really awkward at first, but that's the only way to get it up on the beach. Um, and it's really like an amazing aircraft. It's like one of the most fun machines I think I've ever owned. And I've owned a lot of unique stuff, but the Sea Ray is like a airplane, you know, cheat code almost. It like unlocks like the like the game genie. You can go anywhere and do anything you want. And it's really an incredible machine in, in any seaplane for that matter, but the Sea Ray is so cheap to fly. Uh, maintenance is, is relatively cheap as well. And it's just so much fun that, you know, I, I'm regretting that I haven't done it sooner. Stick or something there, submerged. 
so the one kind of like dark side of flying amphibious aircraft or float planes is insurance. It can be extremely hard to get insurance and if you're able to get it, it can be quite expensive. So my quote last year for coverage on the hull and liability was I believe like $7,200 for a $70,000 hull coverage. You know, so I went with liability only. I was willing to take the risk. If I sunk it, that, you know, sucks. Um, but it's a lot of money for insurance. And, and in comparison, my Grumman Tiger, which seats two more people, flies a lot faster, a lot farther. My insurance is $980 for, I think, $60,000 of hull coverage, which I've since changed this year because the price went up so much. But, you know, it's 80% cheaper or something than the Sea Ray, which is just crazy. And that can be a limiting factor for a lot of people. and. You know, it basically eliminates you being able to finance an aircraft because you have to get full coverage. And imagine if your hull coverage was a quarter million dollars because you had a super cover or something, you know, it's gonna be astronomical, especially for a low time pilot if you're able to get insurance at all. Um, that said, my insurance this year, now that I have 78 hours in the plane and 189 water landings has gone down by almost half. I think my, my coverage for full coverage this year was $4,000. Liability only is $1,515. So some money savings to be had there, which is pretty nice. But honestly, that's the biggest expense for the Sea Ray. The maintenance so far, the parts have been super cheap. We'll see how that changes now because it looks like Progressive Aerodyne may be out of business or temporary out of business and parts, you know, who knows. But as of a couple of weeks ago, you know, parts have been extremely cheap, readily available. It's basically $40 an hour to fly it, which is to me is like, it's free. You know, it's the same cost as driving like a pickup truck. So in addition to learning to fly the aircraft last year, I also did a bunch of maintenance. Some of that was like catch-up maintenance because the plane hadn't been flown much, if at all, in two years. And some of that was upgrades. So the ADSB was intermittent. We had to have that solved. Had to replace the ELT, replace the battery, uh, did the transom seal, the main gear seals, um, some rubber components on the engines and hoses and stuff. I did a couple oil changes. I installed the new splash guard on the bottom of the hull, which prevents the tail wheel from getting blasted with water. After I did that, that first flight, you know, I was like, ah, let's solve that. So now I can actually flare the plane a little bit and that splash guard prevents the tail wheel from getting blasted, which is kind of like a common problem. A lot of guys have damaged their tail wheel by hitting it with water spray. Uh, also put a keel guard on the plane. So when you're beaching it, you know, you're not damaging that fiberglass as much. And you know, a couple little other odds and ends to catch up with maintenance. My main goal was last year to get the plane as sorted as I possibly could so that it is ready to take on backcountry adventures. And more importantly, to get myself as sorted as possible to take on backcountry adventures. You know, if you get a plane stuck beaching it here on the Grand River, there's always somebody that can help you pull it out. Or worst case, I call the wife and she can come sort me out. Um, but if you're 200 miles from anything, you know, you're going to have a bad day. So the airplane actually right now is at its first real conditional with me as the owner. It's getting a five-year rubber replacement on the Rotex engine. It's getting the carbs rebuilt, uh, a bunch of other little odds and ends and things. There's been leaks in the back of the hull that I've been trying to, to sort out anytime you land or especially leave it moored for a bit. A lot of water is getting in. And so checking the seals, sealing everything up back there, there's cables that go through the hull and everything that need to be sealed. Um, and a lot of service bulletins and things too to make sure that the plane is kind of like 100% tip top shape. I, with, with every airplane that I'm involved in, I want the maintenance to be absolutely impeccable. You know, I try not to defer anything. I just want it to be as dialed as possible. And this conditional is kind of like the last step in that. And hopefully from now on, it's, it's sorted out. But you know, towards the end of the year, September and October, and then into November, because I had like two weeks off in November and I flew the wheels off. And I think I did like 25 or 30 hours the first week or two in November, um, you know, I flew it up to Croton Dam. I beached it a bunch of times, checked out some new spots, and I got to do like one of my, I don't have a bucket list, but if I did, one of my dreams, which is take your own seaplane to get some food at a waterfront restaurant by landing in Bostwick Lake and getting, you know, some chicken tenders from the Bostwick Lake Inn, which picking up food with your seaplane is like the most awesome thing ever. Now all I want to do is hit every single possible restaurant in the Great Lakes region that you can get a seaplane to. I want to go to it. You know, and that's pretty much it kind of for like the last year for my seaplane journey. I picked the plane up hopefully this weekend from its conditional inspection. And, you know, I really want to fly 150 hours this summer in the seaplane and I just want to take it everywhere. It's such a cool opportunity to have access to that. And I, I want to take advantage of it while I can.